Welcome everyone to our final webinar for Massachusetts uh, STEM Week. I'm Khalif, the STEM lead at Mass Robotics. Uh, Mass Robotics is a nonprofit independent organization and the hub for robotics, AI, and connected devices. We aim to grow the robotics industry as a whole and inspire the next generation. So for STEM Week, uh, we've decided to do webinars for different STEM kits that are usable by students, teachers, uh, and parents to educate in robotics. First day we did uh, iRobot's root coding robot. Second day we did little bits. Third day we did uh, soft robotics toolkit. And for the final day we're doing BrainCo. Uh, we have two of their uh, two of their people here today that will be talking about what it can offer you as a uh, as a parent, as an educator, or as a student. So I'm going to bring them in here right now, and we'll get started. Hi, everybody. Can you hear me okay? I can hear you just fine. Okay, awesome. Let me get all configured here. I'm going to share my screen. I must admit I am new to GoToWebinar, but we're all technology-enabled people, so we're going to figure it out. Um, yeah, so welcome, everybody, to our webinar. Uh, thank you, Khalif. Thank you, everybody at Mass Robotics. Um, you've always been such a big supporter of everything here in the state and it really shows so thanks for having the opportunity and thank you everybody for coming on board um i imagine you've all been going through a series of uh, bland webinars and maybe you're taking classes online or your work has turned to this so i'm going to make this as exciting as i possibly can we've got a ton of great content lined up for you and we'll have a little bit of fun and we have some prizes for you too so i'm just going to jump right into it and you will learn everything about us through our agenda so what we'll do, just so you can all arrange your time, uh, we're going to do some introductions first of all. So who am I? Uh, who are our company? Uh, and then we're going to talk about, just as Khalif mentioned, we have this wonderful kit that combines AI, prosthetic technology, with applications for high schoolers and middle schoolers. So what's that all about? And what do some of the lessons look like? Um, we'll do some stuff there. Uh, then we're going to have a fun fact, a quiz. So you will be quizzed on the contents of this lecture. So hopefully we won't torture you too much. And the winner of our quiz will get a free set. So if you stay on board until we have our last uh, few minutes uh, together, then we're gonna be going through a couple of questions that are based off of the material in this lecture. And then uh, the winner will get a, a kit mailed out to you. So we'll have it all figured out. And then finally, we'll have uh, plenty of time left over for any questions that you might have, anything else that you wanna talk about. Uh, so that's what we'll be looking at today. Without further ado, let's uh, learn about what we have. So the free kit that we'll be offering at the end. Um, what it, it comes with a full hardware solution, uh, coding tools, uh, full curriculum for over 50 classes, and registration to our remote STEM competition. Um, so I'll show you more information of that during our lecture, but please stay tuned for that quiz. It's gonna be super fun. All right, so let's do some introductions. So there are two wonderful gentlemen with you here today. Uh, so I am Andrew, um, if you are a fan of robotics competitions. Uh, I actually used to manage the first robotics program in China. Uh, so we were about 40,000 students. I did that for about five years and I've been doing all kinds of international STEM programs. Uh, that came on to Brinco about a year ago. And what has been great here is we've been able to take these really cutting edge technologies that we'll introduce you to in a moment and modify them so that you can uh, implement these in the classroom or at home as an educator or a student. So you're gonna learn all about that today and I'm very excited to talk to you about it. And here is Josh. So Josh is on the phone and I'll let him take it over from here. Thank you, Andrew. Thank you. And thank you everyone for coming out today and partaking with us. We really do appreciate it. Uh, I'm Josh. I am the Associate Director of Strategic Partnerships for BrainCo. And a little bit about myself before this, uh, worked for Samsung Electronics America for about five and a half years, led a lot of really amazing initiatives, especially within uh, corporate social responsibility and trying to make technology, of course, equitable and inclusive along the way. And we have some of the same amazing ideas and same amazing methods here at BrainCo. And I'm going to tell you a little bit about who we are, what we do, and why we're all here today. So, to start off with prosthetic technology, where are we from? Where do we get our start? We're still here to this day. Somerville, Massachusetts is where we're headquartered. Uh, we are 
got our start out of the Harvard iLab, and then from there we said, hey, let's just move down the block. <laughs> uh, to this day, we're still here creating really amazing, really engaging technologies. Uh, one of them, of course, being our Dexas prosthetic. Uh, some of our other technologies, of course, include brain machine interface technology. Now, what makes this prosthetic so special? <laughs> So what makes it so special is most prosthetics before uh, something like this came out into the world had very limited range of gestures. You're looking at maybe be able to do simple hand movements of maybe eight to 10 different gestures. What we wanted to do here, we wanted to take this technology and try to bring quality of life to amputees all across the world within an equitable way. So most of those prosthetics that I was alluding to earlier, they cost $60,000 starting. Ours is at that ten to fifteen thousand dollar price point, unlimited gestures, and as you can see here, one of our earlier amputees, uh, this gentleman here, Mr. Nee, he's actually now able to write, draw, uh, live out a full day using this technology. And this technology is so groundbreaking because one, it it, it helps people in many ways, but at the same time is so new and it's using a lot of those really amazing AI practices and of course robotics uh, concepts that are connected to engineering. And it takes a team and as Michael Jordan said, talent wins games but teamwork and intelligence wins championships. Uh, STEM, we always like to think of of course the engineers, we always like to think of course of uh, the different developers, the algorithm developers, but it takes a multitude of people with a multitude of backgrounds to create something like that you just saw. From project managers to researchers trying to understand the latest technology and at the same time bring it into a, a beautiful design form that can go on and make an impact. And to that point, this team was able to bring forward and amazing accolades uh, back here in Somerville. Time Magazine's Best Invention of 2019, Red Dot Best of the Best, Edison Awards, and of course, uh, Digital Trends Award. So this team, after they won these accolades, worked together, they asked themselves, what can we do as a, as a company to take these really amazing ideas and concepts that are connected to the biotech space, which is growing and growing every single day right here in our own backyard? and bring it into where it can do the most impact, and that's the education space. I'm gonna pass it over to Andrew to talk about that. Sure, so perfect setup there. And Josh made a great comment saying that it really took a whole village to put together this kind of a product where I imagine a lot of you on the other side of this webinar know very deeply you need uh, software developers, you need uh, you know hardware engineers, um, all kinds of different people to come together to create something like this. So we saw this as an amazing opportunity where figuring out how you can get a idea for a socially conscious mission paired together with learning specific skills in computer science, in hardware engineering, in engineering design, uh, all those different AI, uh, brain machine interface technology. So it was an amazing platform to investigate all those things from a completely new lens. Um, we've all seen a lot of different educational robots out there. There's all kinds of different stuff you can use. Uh, but it's nice to do something very different. And in this case, we were able to create an educational set that's based on all the amazing parts of that prosthetic uh, hand that Josh just mentioned. So you can see here, we've taken the most basic components of bio biomechanical movement, um, control mechanisms, artificial intelligence, and we have a lot more stuff coming down the pike too. Uh, so what I thought I would do with everybody today is we're gonna talk a little bit about what's inside of that kit, how it works, and I'll show you some of the ways that we've connected it with the actual prosthetic and the lessons that uh, students and educators can do. Um, so as you can see, we've taken that technology and we've put it into a classroom format. So you can think of it as putting together one of these sets. Uh, you, like we said, you need that hardware engineer. So you're gonna have to have somebody who understands the biomechanical movement of a hand. So we can do that through the construction and the activities that we've designed for it. You need people who understand how it's controlled. So as you can see that the control mechanism is completely transparent. Students have to learn how to put all those different pieces together and make sure they integrate. Uh, then you have to implement things like programming. So we have a programming interface where students can code different motions onto the kit. You need a, uh, a different kind of prototyping mechanism. So we provide all kinds of 3D printing activities and uh, models that people can use so that you can experiment with different builds and you can actually put it on your arm. So all kinds of different stuff and um, all put into a classroom format. We have a bunch of curriculum that supports this. 
Uh, so everything from uh, project guided activities for assembly to biomedical in, in exploration, programming, applied AI. And what we like to do is make sure everybody is competent enough in a certain one of these skill sets so that they can then go on and enter into our competition where it's up to you. We give you this big problem just like our engineers had. You have to make a, a socially conscious dent in some kind of a big engineering problem. You submit that to us and our actual MIT and Harvard engineers will review it uh, and give out a ton of different awards and prizes. So speaking of which, uh, that's here's a description right here. So this year, we are challenging students from around the world to use our set as a base. They're also welcome to use anything else that they find is appropriate if you want to integrate other motors or uh, printed materials or whatever uh, to solve this problem. Right? How can we improve life for amputees? So it's an open design project. If you can think of something and build it, then you can submit it to us. So what students are currently working on, and it's actually worked quite well in a remote and hybrid environment where people are really spending more time about thinking about these problems and uh, prototyping with a, 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 a turnkey kit in front of them. Um, so they're creating physical prototypes to solve the problem that they've identified. And they then create a video introduction, a written report, which are being sent to us by December 20th, where we have this panel who will review all the submissions. So Mr. Han, as a product of the Harvard uh, Brain Center, uh, he's uh, an MIT innovator under 35 and is actually the founder of BrainCo. Uh, Dr. Jamal is an MIT brain machine interface postdoc. Uh, she's been doing all kinds of brain machine interface uh, engineering for uh, quite a few years now. And uh, Dr. Wu is actually the lead engineer on the prosthetic itself. And I'm, as you already heard my background, and I've been very fortunate to work with some amazing educators on creating the educational frameworks for this. So we will be giving out cash prizes. Uh, so to three middle school teams and the three high school teams uh, in January after we get our submissions in December. So if you're interested in this, feel free to check out the link. Um, you'll find everything you need to get started, and we'd be more than happy to walk you through any other questions that you have uh, when we get to the questions part. So we've just given you the whole background on the set uh, and where it comes from. So what we thought would be really fun is we could show you some of the actual ways that uh, students and educators have used this to model that actual engineering process. So the first, so these are all straight out of our curriculum. Uh, so one of the ways that we like to uh, bring into our biomedical uh, engineering framework is really having people understand the basics of the human hand. And what's actually interesting is from a brain machine interface technology point of view, if you're to map out the parts of the brain that correlate with hand movement, it's actually one of the largest uh, cubic um, amount of volume in your brain compared to other parts of your body because you can there's lots of different degrees of freedom, there's lots of sensitivity, um, and the way that you manipulate it is so different for different objects. So you're applying different forces to things. So one place that we like to start, which has direct applications for uh, moving around our kit, is the actual different hand grips that a human can perform to pick up different items. So uh, we have a couple that I was gonna present to you here. So you can see we have some precision grips and some power grips. So you can think of it as those that are needed for light touches and like really hard grips, right? So depending on what you're using. So just saying precision grips here, are more for picking up delicate items and being more careful with something. Uh, and our power grips are more for grabbing onto something while you're performing some kind of work. So maybe a lever, uh, you know, maybe you're picking something up. So all those kind of things. And uh, there's five different prehensile grips that a human hand can perform. Um, so you can see here, depending on the kind of object that you're looking to manipulate, um, there's different kinds of motions for that. And these actually all come from the standardized assessment tool that actual prosthetists use to fit a prosthetic onto an amputee. So what we do is we have our students investigate these, and then we can actually show them like how this works with our prosthetic. So here you'll see that lateral grip that was from the previous slide uh, performed on our prosthetic that Josh mentioned earlier. Uh, so another great thing about this prosthetic, in case it wasn't clear to the video too, is it's actually controlled by EMG sensors uh, in your wrist. So an amputee gets a special kind of sensor put on their arm, and then those muscle signals that are detected through the sensor are driven through our AI algorithms, and that is performed into some kind of motion here. So within a, a short period of time, an amputee can actually figure out how to control the prosthetic according to what their muscle signals are telling it to do. Um, so here's one of the ways that our students in our competition last year uh, took some of that information. I purposely have the sound off so I can talk over it. I know the sound quality is not always that great. So this student was able to uh, investigate different kinds of human grip as it it applies to picking up different items. So you can see here, uh, he's going for like a lighter grip on some of the lighter items, like a cup and a phone. However, this is when our material science uh, comes into play, and we have some lessons on this too. 
where you're going to really need to start to think about friction coefficients. So this is all about part of that problem discovery process. Uh, what we really don't like to do is provide people with a bunch of pre-canned answers about how everything works. We like to provide the frameworks where students can investigate themselves and they can really figure out how these different pieces interplay with each other. So in this case, uh, this student was able to put together uh, different items that would increase the, the friction coefficients on the hand and would enable a amputee to pick up items that it couldn't have with um, the materials that were provided uh, on the kit. So there's some interesting experiments that you can run there. So from a biomedical point of view, we've had a lot of students investigate uh, grip. Uh, we also have a that 3D printing curriculum where students can really play into, you know, if you are going to find the best solution to manipulate different items in the house, then maybe a, a model based on a human hand is not the right way to go. Maybe you need to have uh, some other kind of uh, uh, an attachment to uh, your hand. So there's all kinds of different ways that you can play around with things. It's not just moving around a little robot on a table that like you can really investigate things, pick things up and play around. So the other big uh, topic area that we like to uh, introduce to people is uh, AI is what really made this prosthetic special. You know, so it translates those garbled muscle signals into an actual uh, motion on a piece of hardware. So there's a lot of opportunity to investigate different things. Uh, so any of you educators out there, um, I'm actually very curious to see uh, what you're out there doing to teach AI. Uh, my guiding lodestar, lodestone for everything that we do for AI has been uh, five big ideas in artificial intelligence, uh, brought to us by the AI uh, for K-12 group uh, based out of um, Pennsylvania. And they've broken down what people should understand about AI into five big parts, right? So if you were going to have anybody say that they understand AI, then they'd like to organize it into these five big topic areas. Right, so uh, these different items using AI are perceiving the world in some way, uh, they're representing it in some way, they learn from that, they then have some kind of natural interaction with the world, and it's very important that this technology is applied towards a social impact problem. Right, so you can see through what we put together in our set, we're able to have different sensors where students can interact with this stuff. Um, we have different uh, code block case, uh, block-based coding mechanisms and other things too, where we can take that uh, sensor data and turn it into certain kinds of movements. We can classify things and learn with that system. Uh, you can have different kinds of interaction. And finally, uh, our biggest part, what's that social impact, right? So how are we really going to help people using this technology? Um, so I'm going to fly through this so you can see a lot of it uh, and make sure we have enough time for our quiz. So one thing we like to start with, uh, we like to really focus on the application of these technologies. I think uh, too much work in the classroom on the conceptual part of it gets very boring. And in STEM, we really like to get stuff moving. So one way we like to start off is by showing off image recognition, right? So in a lot of these different uh, AI technologies, what's being collected through cameras in some way uh, is being classified through these different uh, AI algorithms and being turned into some kind of a motion, right? So you can think of it as what's going on with different traffic detectors, um, like out in the world, uh, facial recognition technology comes from this. So how can we turn this into some kind of a way that a student could apply this to an actual socially uh, conscious mission? And uh, there's a lot of things that students have to understand. So we don't want to go through all this different kind of conceptual things. We really want to make sure that students can make that connection between uh, cameras being able to perceive the world, uh, computer being able to represent it through that AI for K-12 framework, and then what kind of impact can it really have? So what we start off with is uh, all kinds of different gestures that students can make. So we have this within this kit, um, we start off with the Shaka sign. Uh, so it's actually, it's actually very popular with uh, some of our learners um, in Asia, where this is a, like a, a symbol of, you know, we're having a really good time. So what we start off with is with our kit, just like you can see in our actual prosthetic, right? So our prosthetic can actually have this as a pre-built gesture. How can you use AI to make that pre-built gesture on your kit, uh, on your uh, model prosthetic? So here, Right, you can set up your whole AI environment. So I'm not going to go through all that. We don't have a ton of time, but um, within our software, you can set up um, how the camera is detecting your hand gesture. Right, so you can classify what each gesture you want to be uh, associated with a certain kind of movement, and then you can code it in yourself. So here's the the product of what our students put together. So if you were to make this uh, gesture, how would you do it? Well, you put it, you put all your uh, like algorithms correctly, and then you can play around with it in real time. So here's one of the warm-up activities that we do, and it has you can see some direct application to the kit itself. From there, um, another easy way to move into AI is by going into text recognition, 
right? So just like cameras can pick up on uh, facial data, uh, you can train it to recognize different kinds of you know vehicles on the road. Uh, we can also have some very robust tech recognition um, technology, and that's another great way that you can use some uh, materials in the classroom to make it really easy to implement this without having to do some really really high uh, level lift. So one uh, experiment that we have students play around with is this withdrawal reflex. So we've all put our hands on something very hot and had to push back very quickly. So how can we mimic that via AI, right? So how can you have uh, different kinds of data uh, going into your model prosthetic to have some kind of an actual output? So another one of our warm-up warm activities, uh, we actually do that with text recognition. So here, uh, we have a bunch of different uh, written commands that students have to code and they can use all kinds of different stuff. And when you give certain kinds of data points, how do you want your kit to react? So we've had this implemented with lots of different groups of students together, and you can have different objects around the room uh, with different kinds of values associated with them, and you can represent that via uh, text recognition. So the students have to go into their uh, programming environment, make sure that they can set up all the different uh, classifiers the right way, and uh, make sure that they're getting the right movements for what they wanna do, and they can have this whole interactive experience with this real uh, like social background behind it. Um, so in this case, you know, this is based on like an actual bio, uh, like biomedical application. Uh, you could have this put into all kinds of different contexts too. And then uh, some other ways that we'd like to bring in some other socially impactful uh, applications are by combining these different items. So one that's a really big act fun activity is by making sure that students can apply AI into sign language in some way, right? So they could have this as a hand that could react to different kinds of sensor data coming in to then uh, give off different kinds of sign language just as an amputee would wanna do with their prosthetic. Um, or you could have it the opposite way, right? You could have a computer that can understand what the data is coming from the, the kit itself, like from their prosthetic. So here you'll see that uh, the way that we start students off with this is by uh, giving them a little bit of background knowledge, right? So they have to understand what the technology itself has to do, right? So we teach them a couple of different sign language gestures so in this case, I don't know if anybody knows what these are. So we have one on the left and one on the right. So I don't expect anybody here to be an expert in sign language, but if you are, I'm very impressed. The one on the left is love, and the one on the right is actually thank you. And these next two, uh, so these do end up taking two hands, but it's a nice uh, way to get people up and moving. Uh, so we have one left, one on the right. I just noticed this actor is very expressive. So even if he, uh, I'm sure he could communicate a lot of what he needed without even using his hands, but we have a cry on the left and we have a sorry on the right. So now we can move into is, let's think of some ways that we could apply this onto a prosthetic hand. Well, we can start off with uh, doing different letters, right? So we can have an autonomous hand, right? You can, you, you can use your uh, choice of a AI technology to spell out your name or really any word that you're looking for uh, with that. So you're gonna have to figure out uh, how to code it into your uh, environment. You're gonna have to make sure that it can work appropriately with your hardware. Uh, and of course, like we said before, just as it takes a village to put together a prosthetic piece of equipment, you have, before you even get to the step, you have to make sure that you can assemble your kit. You have to make sure that you can understand the electrical engineering behind how it all gets put together. Um, so once they get to this point, they really have that broad knowledge of you know, what's going into this technology as a whole. So. Um, I won't explain all these here, but you can see here we have a bunch of different hand gestures based on uh, letters. So the exact same ones that you would use in the American Sign Language, uh, even the ones that are uh, based on an actual movement of an arm. So we even have different ways that students can 3D print out uh, their own prosthetic arm to put their kit onto. So they could actually do the, the whole motion with their uh, arm. Anyway, so we have a couple different examples here. Andrew, I think you're cutting out for everyone. I can't hear you anymore. Yeah. So what we're looking at here right now is we're looking at just a 
a way within block-based coding that individuals will have the ability and students themselves to go through these different methods of uh, recognition. And this is something that we always like to show people and display uh, and show students the real world impact of how we're trying to take what Andrew was alluding to earlier and then bring it into a really, really easy way to understand uh, more complicated issues that are taking place in and through our equipment. Uh, thank you. I got you, Andrew. It's all good. It happens. We're all been there. It's still cutting in. It's still cutting in. I don't know why. I, and I know. And it doesn't take a village here, but it doesn't take a village to build a prosthetic. It's apparently to do a webinar as well. Okay. okay. Uh, then, well, I mean, that actually takes us through a lot of our uh, curriculum here. There's a lot more that I can go into. I think what I could do is um, I can show you more during our Q&A if you'd like. Um, but, uh, you know, one of the things that I know everybody's looking forward to is we could jump right into our quiz. And then this way, uh, if my mic cuts out again, then nobody's tortured on to figure out what I'm saying. So we could jump right into this. Uh, Josh, if my mic comes, uh, cuts out, if you could please uh, help me administer this. So if everybody could get ready, uh, what we're going to do is we're going to give three questions, right? And uh, once the question comes up, you can type into your chat box the letter of the correct answer, right? The letter of the correct answer. And the first person that gets it right is going to be given a point. And we're going to have uh, three different questions. In case we have a tie between a bunch of people or we don't have a clear winner, we do have a tiebreaker round. And the one who gets that question right on the, the, the fastest will be our winner of the kit. So if you all paid attention to me and hopefully heard what was being said through the microphone, then I think you're going to be more than ready to take this on. So, uh, Josh, yeah, if they could you please use the Q&A section. Uh, Khalif, thank you for letting us know. <laughs> uh, and that, and that's right. where we're able to get it going. There you go, Andrew. Great. All right. So we're all set. Let's get started. So our first question, and just as Josh and Khalif mentioned, please use the Q&A section, is how many basic pre uh, grips is the human hand capable of? Is it A3, B7, C5, or D9? I'll give everybody a couple minutes, or uh, about 10 more seconds. So how many basic prehensile grips is the human hand capable of? So that's on a slide. And here comes the correct answer. So I cannot see the Q&A section, but we will find our winner. So our answer is C. So the human hand is capable of five different basic prehensile grips. So I'll give uh, Khalif a minute to process that. Khalif, do we have somebody on there? We do. Awesome. Oh, boy. Do you happen to know the name? We can get a ranking board going. Oh, OK. So the, uh, the first correct answer was from Daryl. OK. Daryl. Good job, Daryl. All right. Congratulations. He's paying attention. <laughs> All right. So our second question. So you still got two more shots. What does this gesture mean? Does this mean A, love, B, thank you, C, cry, or D, sorry? What does this gesture mean? I'll give you about five more seconds. Looking for the meaning of that gesture. All right, and now I'm gonna move into our answer. And our answer is, a love. That is the gesture for love. First correct oh, answer. I can, I can from give Sharon. Sharon. All right. Well done, Sharon. So Daryl and Sharon are paying attention. I hope everybody can follow their example. <laughs> but you still have all you still have one more opportunity. So Daryl or Sharon, if you get this next one, then you are our automatic winner. Otherwise, we will go into our tiebreaker. All right, so here we go. For question three. What year did Brain Robotics win Time Magazine top invention? Was it A, 2020, B, 2019, C, 2018, or D, 2017? So I'll give you a five more seconds. So what year did Brain Robotics win Time Magazine top invention? 
This is the moment people wish they can go back on the slides. <laughs> <laughs> I, know. I know. This is not an open book quiz. All right. So here we go. And our winner is 2019. So Brain Robotics won Time Magazine's top invention of the year in 2019. And now we're anxiously awaiting Khalif's response. Drum roll. Drum roll, please. Now we got a winner. Hey, congrats. All right, who do we got? Daryl, uh, you got two of them right. You beat out Sharon. Congrats, congrats. <laughs> All right, congratulations, Daryl. So we'll um we'll get in touch with you via email and we'll coordinate all that stuff. But uh we'll do this tiebreaker just for fun. Um if you're all interested. So what does BMI stand for? Is it A brain machine interface? B uh excuse me, A brain mechanical interface, B brain machine interface, C brain motion interface, or D body muscle interface. Give you a couple of seconds. I know Josh knows the answer. I've been working with for a while, but sometimes it escapes me. <laughs> <laughs> oh, true. And of course, it's brain machine interface. So if you got that right, you Darryl, earn my undying this. Oh, Daryl got it again? Oh, my God. Daryl, you got to come work for us. He came here, man. He, had a, he, was, he was dialed in when this started. Shout out to Daryl for being dialed in. Great job. Yeah. All right. So Daryl, congratulations. You are a winner. We'll figure out all the logistics stuff with you. Um, and thank you everybody for paying attention to this. Um, we have uh, lots of different stuff that we can share with everybody. But before I jumped into anything other specific things um, or Josh does, then we'd like to open up for any questions. So if you have any questions about um, like the kit or the competition, uh, you know, what we're doing in the, this, virtual remote environment, uh, anything like that, we'd be happy to answer. So I'll pass this over to our Q&A chat. All right, uh, there was a question uh, asked earlier uh, about the about the coding side. Is this scratch-based and can you, use, can you incorporate actual coding? Yes, so the, what you saw with that interface, we utilize a program called uh, mBlock, which is a Scratch 3.0 enhancement. And you can actually, if you're familiar with Scratch, you can actually literally drag and drop your Scratch programs into that environment. Uh, what we found is it's a bit better compatible with uh, hardware and you can, it has a lot more AI functions. So you use that and for coding itself, we use that as the way for students to get started, right? So anybody out there who's doing block-based programming, you know, you can jump right into that uh, with this piece of hardware, uh, but we can also do uh, use a C++ as well. Um, and coming very soon, we're going to have uh, like Python available on our kit, along with a bunch of curriculum uh, and a bunch of other AI functions through that. Let's see. Uh, next question, for the competition, do you have to use a kit or can you develop ideas without it? So, uh, yep, so what we do is that we ask that anybody who gets involved with the competition uh, use that piece, of, use that kit as a baseline. So the way to get started and level the playing field. Uh, we don't, uh, there's no hard and fast rule on how exactly or what you use within that kit. Um, if you wanna use some basic stuff out of there and then you know modify it with a bunch of other stuff that you have available with you, that's totally fine, so long as it fits the challenge theme and description. If you go on our website at the bottom, you'll see um, a downloadable link where you can find all the specific rules and the rubric that we use to judge our winner. Uh, but you can think of the kit as not just your hardware and software piece to get into it, uh, but also your ticket to entry into the competition as well. And another thing is we also provide our CAD files for our finger components. And the reason why we do that is because, hey, there's a lot of creativity out there and students come up with some of the most innovative ideas. Uh, I'll give you an example of one. We had a school where they turned the digits into utility. So for example, the different fingertips were, one was a key, one was a screw, uh, almost a hand that was like a Swiss army knife. And then we have other schools that we're working with that are examining how to build out their own sleeves, how to make them something different to what we're doing. And, and that's what it's really all about. We wanna see that creativity from students. You know, we want them to be invested into this competition and 
we like to give the educator a lot of curriculum, a lot of resources, and then from there, allow these students to take what they've learned uh, during that time and take it to the next level from a design standpoint and other innovative thinking. Yeah, and to, to Josh was right on the money there, and uh, I'll add on to that too by saying, uh, with the hardware that you uh, purchase in that set, uh, everything comes included. So like registration into the competition, um, all the coding tools that you saw, um, all of our curriculum, so over 50 hours worth of lessons, uh, plus a, like the 3D printing files that Josh mentioned. So if you wanna, if you like the, the, the way that the, the kit moves, like you can actually customize all those things and it all comes together. So there's no subscriptions or like licensing. Okay. Any uh, any other questions come through? Going once, going twice. I know it's been a long week for many of you. <laughs> Something I also uh, want to just can rebuild it and take it apart many times. So up to about 35 times it can be reutilized. And we did that on purpose because we want the school to be able to move it around the environments into different classrooms. Uh, and I know Andrew was able to share his scopes and sequences. There's a lot of different areas where we uh, fit very strongly. Sorry, Khalif, what were you saying? Good. We have a couple couple more questions. Um, one question is, what kind of sensors are in the fingers? Do they have some kind of force sensor? Yeah, so the, the, the fingers themselves uh, don't have any sensors. So we the, the kit itself comes with uh, an IR sensor right out of the, the package. There's also you know, that you can integrate whatever is connected to your computer uh, for those AI things that you saw. So like cameras and microphones and all those kind of things. Um, but it's uh, it's based off of, a, uh, we have an Uno controller that powers it. Uh, if there's any other sensors that you want to integrate into that, you totally can. So we'll be having other things that come within the set uh, later on. But, um, you know, whatever, uh, like cheap accessories you want to put in there, uh, they'll all be compatible. Yeah. yeah, so anyone is used to using those Unos in the past, um, if you worked with something else within your school that you already incorporated, it's, it's very easy to add into it and to, to build it up within different ways. Uh, for example, there was a school who w was looking at the, the grip coefficient and said, we need to make it a bit stronger. And they actually redesigned how the servo motors functioned uh, from our own design. And from that, they actually were able to increase that grip strength and simultaneously uh, break the design in the sense that they pushed it forward in a way where they wanted to be able to pick up heavy everyday objects. Um, so in our chat, we have a, a health assisting nurse and, it, and she's wondering if this is a, a demonstration someone could do for students to see what's available for patients. That's well. First of all, thank you for everything you're doing now. It's got to be a crazy time to be in the field. Could you actually repeat that question one more time so I understood it correctly? Uh, is is this a demonstration someone could do for students to see what's available uh, to patients? Uh, yes. So uh, what we've so like through the activities and lessons that we've put together, like we've made that connection a little bit more clear. So you can think of it as like, a couple of different things in relation to that. Uh, demonstration that you're talking about. So it could either be, you know, at its core, we like this to be uh, integrated into STEM programs, so that if teachers and students and uh, people want to understand all the nuts and bolts of how these things work on a, a basic level. So like I mentioned, going from uh, a bunch of uh, uh, disassembled parts, like really figuring out, okay, the micro, we need to have a controller in this this uh, apparatus, you know, it needs to be uh, coded and wired the right way. Uh, so this is the mechanism where people can learn all those basic things. But then if you want to get to the point where you're demoing out how different applications of a prosthetic would work for different patients, uh, you can absolutely do that. So the activities that you saw in there, we have some other ones that are a bit more uh, technical on things like uh, like a grip strength and, um, you know, like how you're, uh, the, there's actually uh, strings on the inside that pull just like tendons, right? So if you're modifying different parts of that, how is that going to affect your different, uh, you know, grips or other other ways that you can, um, strengthen like how that uh, grip works with different things. Uh, so you can use it as like a, a demo. Uh, there's stuff that you can, there's instructions to build it right on the box and play around with if you want to do that. But you can go into much more deeper areas of that demo if you wish. Yeah, and, and for example, uh, 
we have seen uh, some of our other schools that we've worked with incorporate EMG sensors. So they went out, they had, they looked into different sensor tech and EMG tech is the tech that we use within our own prosthetic. Um, and it's something that has been able to work on the STEM kit as another really amazing way to show how EMG technology functions. So it's a very, very powerful demonstration because as a student can see pretty easily like, oh, I clenched my fist and then because I clenched my fist, that signal is now going into a prosthetic. That's, that's how it works for the most part within our own prosthetic. So they can see how the latest technology is being utilized within a very unique experience. And at the same time, makes that real world connection very clear. Uh, next question, how is the tech support? Ah, okay. So I love this stuff. So for me, what we've done here, <laughs> we, we've made our kit the way it was. So if it's in an educational environment, you can use a lot of components that you already have within your space. There's server, server motors in there, there's 3D printing's a part of it, but now let's say something gets lost, something gets broken, uh, something gets thrown across the room, who knows? Uh, we actually do have repair bundles that we can send out that uh, cover most commonly lost parts. Additionally, in terms of consumables, the only real consumable that we have there is the, the string that we've used for the tendons, and that's actually good for roughly 80 bills. So we, we, yes, someone went through this and they said, okay, this is roughly 80 builds. And we like to make it as easy as possible for an educator or for any user like to, hey, something's not working, something's not happening. We do have a whole triage that we'll send people through in terms of professional development uh, and resources for educators. We have a complete curriculum guidebook which will go through all of our lesson plans, all of the curriculum alignments. So an educator, uh, within a very short period of time in terms of professional development can get into the classroom and be able to grab and go and be able to focus on what they do best which is to educate so we like to make it as low lift for an educator as possible we realize things get broken things get lost along the way that's just that's just life and but we also like to make sure that people have resources available and at the same time have support available to them from our own staff or any other of the educational partners that we work with. Awesome, any last questions? Weighing on it. <laughs> there's, um, there, there's a lot of support for what you guys are doing uh, in the Q&A section. Uh, and some people are wondering about how can they get further in, uh, further in contact with you and how they can collaborate with you in some way. Yeah, yeah. Um, so right there, you know, you see our emails, that's to us. Um, we have no, we, we will probably directly to you. We can send over some additional resources. Um, we have no problem sharing with you our curriculum and what we're doing there. And we love having conversations with people and we love exploring and talking to you and learn about your STEM initiatives and how we can be a part of it. So. Yeah, feel free to email us. We will get back to you, we promise. And uh, thank you for your time today. Thank you for carving it out of your schedules. And we know we've been through this, these webinars for a very long time. And uh, we're very appreciative of you taking your time today to speak with us and meet with us. So we got two last Absolutely. questions. Thank you for, uh, oh, we got two. Okay. Yeah. We got two <laughs> right at the last minute. Oh man, last minute. Uh, Love the it. first one, uh, do you work with nonprofit organizations? Yes, we do work with nonprofits. Uh, for us, you know, as a child of the New York State public school system, equity and inclusion is something that I've always done within our in my career, and it's something that we at BrainCo also have been pushing forward. Uh, we want our technology to be in the hands of students all across the country, all across the world, and we want them to to be able to utilize this great technology within biotech and biomedical because it's a field that's constantly growing. So yeah, we'd love to work with nonprofit organizations. And the final question uh, from our good friend, Daryl, uh, he, he retired engineering to be a teacher 
And he's wondering if you can do a Zoom with the class. Ooh, Daryl. All right, yeah, we can we can schedule something. We just gotta look at the calendar, but we would love it. Yeah. Oh, uh, but my my apologies, Daryl. Daryl is a lady. Oh well, that's that Daryl. Either which, thank you. We would love to, and we would love to be a part of it. Um, we have to we have to email Daryl after this. So uh, as soon as we get that email information over, we'll we'll send an email out and we'll connect and we'll figure it out. Awesome. Thank okay. you guys so much for coming on. Uh, thank you everyone for tuning in. If you want to see the recordings for this, they'll be on the Master Robotics website. Um, and as well as recordings for all the other ones we did this week. Thank you for attending. It's been great. Thank you all. Thank you, everybody.